Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening. Here we are in the first IFSLAC webinar, Thursday, April 23rd. Here in Guatemala, we are 5 a.m. So very early in the morning. Welcome to the, the world of IFS. So we are going to have our first uh, IFSLAC webinar called Marginal Ulcer After Gassy Bypass. We're going to talk about only and why gassy bypass, okay? For this, I have uh, the privilege to be with some very good specialists. Dr. Juan Antonio Lopez Corvala from Tijuana, he's going to be giving us the presentation. Juan Antonio is a very good friend of us. He is in Tijuana, Mexico. He works at Hospital Los Angeles de Tijuana, and he is the chief of the Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery Unit. He's an advanced laparoscopic surgeon, bariatric and metabolic surgeon. He has been trained more than 500 fellows in laparoscopic advance. Juan Antonio is the past president, past, 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 past president of AMSE, American Society, Mexican Society of the of Endoscopic Surgery, and past president of the Colegio Mexicano de Cirugía de Obesidad y Enfermedades Metabólicas. He is an expert. The other gentleman here with me, with us are Dr. Marcos Leao. Say hi, Marcos. How are you? Marcos is the president of the Brazilian Society of Bariatric and Metabolic Surgery. He's going to be one of the panelists. Dr. Axel Vesco. Axel mm -hmm. is a staff surgeon of the General Surgery Service of the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires, and he's the chief of the Upper GI and Bariatric Surgery Division. Hello, Axel. Welcome. And here again, this is uh, Luciano Poggi. He's a very good friend of us. He's a staff surgeon of the Clinica Angloamericana Lima, Peru, and he's associate professor of surgery of Universidad Peruana Cayetano, Cayetano Heredia. Here with us too is Professor Cayetano Marquesini. You know very well who is Mark Cayetano. He's a past mm -hmm. president too of the Brazilian Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery. He's an expert. He's a very good friend. And uh, Pedro Martinez, uh, with Caetano, they're going to the, pa the, the, the fast checkers. Fast checkers means that they are going to control that everything is going very well in this, um, in this webinar. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you very much to you two guys that you are watching us in the first IFSLAC webinar. So Juan Antonio, we're going to start with you. Uh, but first, we're going to make the one question just before the before the presentation starts. So please pass us the first, we're going to vote. Uh, we designed five uh, quick poll questions. Please, I need uh, you to vote. Read very well the question. It says, which of the following items is not a risk factor for marginal ulcers? Smoking, poach size, type of anastomosis, linear circular stapler, BMI, NSAIDs. So we are going to vote. Please do your vote. Ready to vote? It's not coming. done okay so we do agree that the bmi is not a risk factor for for um marginal ulcer so thank you very much we are going to continue with the presentation uh please dr juan antonio lopez corbala you have the time is yours okay thank you can you see my slides? Yes, we do. Okay, you can see my slides. Okay, give me one second. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Estuardo. Uh, we are in Tijuana, Mexico now. Here is 4 a.m. in the morning. We are in the Northwest and the border with the United States. Well, this topic is very interesting because the incidence of, of this complication is maybe one of the most important, close to 20%. In some in some reports, okay. 
Okay, well, we are going to start with the definition of uh, margin ultra is so erosion of the mucosa. Most of the time, most of the reports say the, the, the location of this problem is an anastomosis. In the second place, it's in the, in the, in the jejunal site, and sometimes you can find this uh, erosion, this uh, ulcer in the pouch. Some reports say that the first place can be in the jejunum. You know, be careful, but most of the time, most of the time we can find this erosion, this ulcer in the anastomosis gastro jejunum. You know. If we talk about the incident, I told you is uh, the, well, the complication with more incident, we have reports until 25%. Last year, look at this tree's report 10.8. But be careful, most of the time you can find this complication in the first year. Send the from Chile report that he found a lot of a lot of patients in the first four weeks after the surgery, after the gastric, gastric bypass. Be careful if you have symptoms, you need to know how to study this kind of patients. Regarding the risk factor. We have local factors, most of them, they are surgery factor, ischemia. The recommendation is to you absorb suture and to avoid ischemia and how to suture would be important. And the pouch size, fortunately, in this moment, most of the surgeon, we perform a small, a small uh, size of the pouch. But if we talk about more than 10 years, a lot of surgeons used to, used to perform big pouch. Another risk factor would be the staple. What kind of staple do you use? Fortunately, a uh, circular staple, only a few surgeons in this moment, uh, 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 they use this kind of staple to perform the anastomosis. In this paper, most of the ulcer, they have relationships more with the circular staple. Can some, is similar to, to circular staple, and now, and now fortunately, most of the surgeon, in my case as well, I use linear step. We have less possibilities to have marginal ulcer. If we talk about risk factor, the most important risk factor would be the smoking. Be careful because uh, light, moderate, or heavy smoker have the same relationship, have the same incident. When we say light smoker, which we say about five to 10 cigarettes. And another system of factor can be drugs, can be alcohol, and can be uh, uh, present of the helicobacter pylori. And, 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 and this, you can see in this, in this paper, is very important, the incident of smoking in the, in the marginal ulcer. If you talk about smoking, the possibility, the, the what rate is close to five times, to five times if you compare with, with no smokers. And, but we have another risk factor would be important, drugs, anti-inflammatory, uh, helicobacter pylori, hyper, uh, arterial hypertension, but another risk factor important would be the anti-inflammatory, be careful because a lot of patients, they, they, use drugs as a routine you need to you need to be careful with all these kind of patients that use drugs and in in this uh paper the conclusion they are similar to most of the paper incident 6.6 i told you that we have incident from one percent to ten percent in the smoking and the anti-inflammatory were associated with the increase of the risk of marginal ulcers. Fortunately, most of the patients with uh, medical menace, in 90% of the cases, the ulcer can heal. What about uh, symptoms? If the patient has epigastric pain, be careful. If the patient has, in the first month, in the first month, this kind of of symptoms, be careful, you need to study the patient. And if you talk about incident, most of the patient, the first symptom will be 90% of the case in epigastric pain, but we have another like a nausea, vomiting, oral intolerance, dysphagia, and sometimes you can have gastrointestinal bleeding. 
how to do the diagnosis would be important. Barium swallowing is important, yes, because you can uh, dis discard stenosis. Some of the patients, they have nausea, vomiting, reflux, and you need to discard uh, stenosis with the barium swallowing. But the gold standard to do the diagnosis for margin ultra will be the endoscopy, the endoscopy study. What about the treatment? The treatment, don't smoke. Remember, uh, will be important. Remember, if you are light, light smoker from five to 10 cigarettes a day, is the incident is similar if you smoke uh, 20 or 30 or 40 cigarettes a day. And, and then uh, cessation of the smoking will be excellent recommendation to do the gastric bypass. It's difficult. It's difficult for some patients, some of the patients that need treatment, treatment to, to cessation of the smoke. Be careful with that. But we have a lot of things that would be important, uh, like uh, drugs, alcohol, and anti-inflammatories. What about the prophylaxis after gastric bypass? This is very controversial. But in this moment, the recommendation, if you are, if the patient is low risk, the recommendation is to use PPI during one year. Low risk, be careful, okay? The recommendation is to use at least one year after gastric bypass. If the patient is high risk, for example, a smoker and the patient that used uh, anti-inflammatories or the patient drink alcohol or whatever, Remember, the PPI would be for long term. Long term would be important for margin ulcer. What about uh, the margin ulcer, the treatment? The treatment would be medical 90% of the cases, and the recommendation is high dosage of PPI for eight weeks. Sucralfato I use as a routine, but is controversial according to some papers. Be careful with the helicoactive pillory. We need to give the patient treatment always as a routine if the patient is positive to helicoactive pillory. And remember the lifelong PPI. And endoscopy would be the best study to, to follow the patient and to be sure that the ulcer ha has healing. Okay, 10% of the patient, they will need surgery. In some some uh, some problems of the gastric bypass would be mandatory to fix. For example, gastro gastro fistula or large puncture, you need to fix if you have uh, if you have margin margin ultras. But what about with the untreatable ultras? What kind of surgery would be the most important to perform? This is the one of the questions in this webinar. We have different options, endoscopy approach to redo the gastrojejun anastomosis, again, with healthy tissue, to perform gastrojejun anastomosis, uh, redo and truncal vagotomy or reversal gastric bypass. In my opinion, reversal gastric bypass is the most effective but has more complication. We are going to check or we are going to talk about that. For example, what about what, what about, about, about the endoscopy approach? The endoscopy approach is with Apollo. Only few surgeons in the world perform this kind of treatment. And this is the flugogram. They recommend if the diameter of the gastrojejun anastomosis is more than 12 millimeters will be, uh, you can do this approach. If the gastrojejun anastomosis is less than 12 millimeters, they don't recommend, it would be very difficult to do this suture with the Apollo and they put a stain. In, in this paper, they, they operate 11 patients, nine of, nine of them, they did uh, they did the suture with Apollo with good success. But again, only few surgeons in the world perform this kind of approach. It's less invasive if you compare with surgery. What about the trunk called vagotomy? 
Well, the recommendation as well, few cases, few cases in the world, and they recommend to perform the gastrojejunal anastomosis hands-on with absorbable suture, and then to perform truncal vagotomy. They say they, they have good results, but only we have few data. And, the, and what about reversal of the gastric bypass? I like this procedure, a bigger procedure with more complication. And this report from Dr. De Maria and Kelly Inhiga, uh, this is the patient that I perform a uh, reversal of the gastric bypass. The most important 13 patient, they did a uh, reversal and the diagnosis was only margin ulcer. Another 12 patient with the margin ulcer and with malnutrition. Okay, this is the result. Well, this is the, the procedure to do anastomosis with the remanent, gastric remanent with the pouch and you need to cut the alimentary tract and you will have the normal anatomy an anatomy and this is the reversal gastric bypass one of the problems of this procedure that is more effective is the complication in this study the leaks were five per, uh, 10 percent it's too much the sepsis 10 percent and the other problem if you do reversal of the gastric bypass at least in this study regain weight was close to 30 percent in the first year in five years close to 80 percent or 90 percent they regain weight it's one of the most important problems but sometimes is the only way to do a good treatment for margin ultra that is very difficult to heal what about the complication of the margin ulcer? The bleeding, 50%. Most of the time is medical treatment. And perforation, 1%. Remember, smokers have more risk. Okay, uh, the other question, laparoscopic or open approach? Most of the surgeons say laparoscopic approach. Okay, I will explain you a case that I operate a few months ago. This is a case report, female, 50 years old, gastric bypass seven years before the plastic surgery. This patient, the plastic surgeon performed abdominoplasty with uh, plication of the rectors 72 hours the day before my surgery and the only data that the patient had was high doses of anti-inflammatories. In this scan, you can see the contrast out of the pouch. Another point important would be the fluid in the paritocolic gutters. And the most important, the free gas in abdominal cavity out of the digestive tract. The question, if the patient has three days after application of the rectum and the tummy tuck, what kind of approach are you going to do? To do laparoscopy would be very, very difficult because it's, it's almost impossible to have good space in abdominal cavity. And open approach, I remember the patient said, doctor, please don't open my skin, please. Don't open my skin, don't do open approach. Okay, we decide to undo the, the suture of the tummy tuck. We decide as well to rise the skin flap and to undo the plication of the rectors. And then in this part, we start with our laparoscopic approach. This is the first stroker. We will show you something about the video and to explain you what happened with this kind of patient. This is the abdominal cavity. Okay, we start with the exploration of the abdominal cavity, a lot of fluids, a lot of uh, 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 purulent material. We start with the exploration and suction of the fluid. 
of the fluid, we remove all the adhesion and to try to identify our gastric bypass and to, to try to identify uh, the, the, the ulcer and the perforation and the gastric jejun anastomosis. Look at a lot of a lot of uh, purulent material. This is the superior abdominal. Okay, we are in the left in the left side with the suction, and we are going to identify the liver. This is the liver suction. Would be difficult. To identify the tissues, okay, and we start to introduce the rest of the trocar. As soon as we had uh, the correct space in the abdominal cavity, uh, we continue to introducing the rest of the trocars. We we found an important adhesion of the gastric jejun anastomosis attached to the liver. In this moment, we introduce the, the, the liver retractor. Here is the liver retractor to identify the, the gastric jejun anastomosis. This is the adhesion of the pouch to the liver was attached. We cut, cautery was enough to remove the adhesion and to identify the problem. Okay, in this moment, we identify the ulcer, the perforation of the, of the ulcer, we are going to show you. And to clean the cavity, and this is the mucosa. Look at here. This is the mucosa. I will increase a little the speed. We can see the mucosa. If we decide to close, okay, this is very slow. Okay. Okay, we close we close the, 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 the perforation with uh, non absorbable suture proline to O was easy to close a small hole and then we use the small bowel, okay, the gastric jejun anastomosis as a patch. We did two light two layers with the same. The first uh, the second was running suture. Running suture, and after that we decide to do the 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 methylene blue test and to clean all the cavities. This is the surgery that we did, and we put it a drain, and we put it a drain. The patient was uh, the patient was uh, four days in the hospital. Okay. Okay, give me one second. And this four days after surgery, this is our drain, and the other drain are from the plastic surgeon. And we recommend with the plastic surgeon be careful after gastric bypass because they use a lot of anti-inflammatories. In some of the patients, as a routine, they use different kind of drugs. Be careful because perforation is one percent of the complication but is in some cases is life threatening. Okay, my conclusion are marginal ulcer is one of the most common complications after gastric bypass and obesity surgery. A smoker have more risk, be careful with that. Endoscopy is the gold standard for the diagnosis and the follow-up. 
And fortunately, 90% of the cases is medical treatment. In surgery, it's only for complications and when the treatment fails. Thank you very much, everybody. I want to send a message from, we can send a hug and our admiration to all of those people who are fighting against the COVID-19, all the hospital staff, doctors, nurses, and everybody. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Eduardo? Diego. Yes, Juan Antonio. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And a tough case, a difficult case. We can see all the nata, all the yes, inside the belly. Uh, we are ready for the second question, please. The second question of the poll, and we are going to vote. We are going to answer. And this is a very important question. Please read it slowly and answer slowly. For how long do you prescribe PPIs after a room y gastric bypass? Never, one to three months, three to five months, six to 11 months. Please vote now. Ready? Let's see. Okay. One to three months, 46%. But see, one fifth of the people think that one year or more. So there is not a consensus in this. So we can see that there is 46%. So thank you very much. Now, um, Please, Marcos Leao, can you comment about the case? Can you comment about your experience in, um, in right. my regional also? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation for participating in this nice webinar. Uh, since I always uh, have always been a gastric bypass with hand seal single layer anastomosis with non-observable suture i have a very small numbers of uh, marginal ulcers i don't leave any kind of foreign material or uh, ischemic bridge between the 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 the, the anastomosis into the anastomosis so i believe that maybe maybe uh, reduce uh, the incidence of marginal ulcers. But I do have some, of course, and I do have some very important ones. I, but most of them, or all of them, are related to non-steroid drugs. And so I believe that anti-inflammatory drugs is a very strong risk factor, as well as smoking. Uh, but in the other cases that I had, uh, some marginal ulcers. And I had some difficulties to treat people who, which the, the ulcer is in the jejunal size. So my question is, uh, is there any uh, difference between the treatment, between the gastric part of the, the, the user or the jejunal users in the anastomosis. Did I make myself clear? Juan Antonio. Well, uh, the report said that there is no difference. The, the, the more incidence is in the anastomosis in the gastric you know? And I agree with you that the most important risk factor is the tobacco and the drugs. And to use absorbable suture is better than not absorbable as well. But if if is there some difference if the ulcer is in the jejunal side when they got to jejunal anastomosis? I think there is no difference, but I would like to know what what is your opinion on the panel.
Well, what do you think, Marcos, about you asked? Well, well I, I actually asked it because I don't have the, the answer. It's you, well, a, a true yeah. question. Uh, I, I believe that the, 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 the genocide is somewhat more difficult to treat. They, they take a long time. Uh, but I, I don't have this information. That was, that's why I asked uh, if there is any difference in treatment when the, the ulcer is in the gastric side or is in the jejunal side. And let me tell you something. When you have the complication uh, similar to this patient that I'll show you, it's difficult to identify sometimes if it's in the anastomosis or the jejunal side. It's no, of course. I, 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 I was mentioning the previously to to the perforation. I mean, a, a okay. regular uh, uh, stomach cancer. Axel, what is your experience? The you know, or, or in the gastric side? Well, I, I have no experience in differentiating those kinds of marginal ulcer. Um, we have only 10 cases of ulceration in gastric bypass patients, and only one with a small ulcer in the jejunal side of the anastomosis. But uh, it didn't differ in in treatment from the other users in our experience. I don't have a very big user in this uh, position. I don't know. I, I have no answer for Marcos. OK, Luciano? Yeah, uh, this is a really interesting question. Uh, we got to see a lot of uh, marginal ulcer patients, um, especially the, at the time that I was working in the US. And um, we got to do a lot of endoscopies. Uh, the patient would have like minimal pain, will come to the yard, ER, we'll do a lot of tons of endoscopy. And we had actually a very high incidence of marginal ulcer. And if I, I could make a comment, I would say 99% of the time, the ulcer was in the jejunal side. Yeah. And whenever we found the ulcer not in the jejunal side, we were looking to rule out other causes of marginal ulcer, such as, for example, H. pylori, maybe. Uh, but we never, we never found H. pylori. So actually, we never found the cause of this only one single ulcer in the pouch, and the treatment was exactly the same. So just PPI. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a third question, please. Can we put the third question of the poll? When do you recommend a postoperative endoscopy after Ruan was a great question. This was suggested by all the all the panelists. So, when do you recommend a postoperative endoscopy after Ruan Y gastric bypass? Only if symptomatic. Every year after one year from surgery. Every year after two years of, from surgery. Three years after surgery. Every year four years after surgery. So, please vote now. I think that this way, okay, if we have the responses. Okay, so only if symptomatic 76%. So I, I think, uh, Axel, please make a, a comment about this question and make your comments about the marginal ulcers, please. Yes, okay. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. I'm very, very honored for this. Uh, about endoscopy in our cases, we, we perform it between the first and the second year because one of the main indications for ruin Y gastric bypass is GERD. And we are now in a, in a systematic following program by endoscopy to any kind of um, reflux, reflux mucosal lesion. That's the reason why we are performing systematic endoscopy in these patients. Uh, not before, in the first year of Ruan Y gastric bypass, we didn't perform uh, endoscopy only in symptomatic patients. And that's 
maybe that's the reason why the, we find a very low incidence of, of marginal ulceration, less than 1% in our cases. One comment that I want to, to make, it's about the case of Juan Antonio, it's a very interesting case. Uh, first of all, because um, we share some patients with the same situation, with perforations, with a recent surgery. Uh, all three cases that we operated with a marginal also perforation were uh, in a recent post-operative for another kind of surgeons, you know, maybe pterodectomy, abdominoplasty, and when ventral uh, hernia plastic. So uh, I, I think that it's very important to recommend to our patients with this kind of surgery that in every situation of uh, an elective surgery in the future, after bypass, they, may, they might be protected with PPI. I think that that's, it's a very good recommendation for our patients. And the last thing I want to comment, and I want the, the opinion of all of you, it's about the type of prophylaxis. Uh, we use esomeprazole in, in pill presentation. I don't know if omeprazole in capsule have the same absorption. Maybe you, you have read some work from Boston that they recommend opening the capsule because the absorption may be different maybe very low in gastric bypass patients. I want to know your opinion. Thank you very much. Luciano, any comment about that? The use of endoscopy, how often? Yes, we, if the patient, and I agree completely with Dr. Besco, if the patient had, for example, uh, Barrett esophagus, we're gonna follow Barrett esophagus protocol. We usually, I usually don't do an endoscopy before one year unless the patient has symptoms, and then it's going to be yearly, usually for the first three years, and then I will go again and get into the regular follow-up protocol um, if the patient had esophagitis or barred esophagus. And uh, what well, actually what we've been seeing is that the patients get really, we really, really the esophagitis resolved. In terms of marginal ulcer. Um, if the patient have minimal pain, I have a very, very low threshold to, to do an endoscopy. Usually, I will not do an endoscopy before a month of, of the surgery. And if the patient has symptoms, uh, the patients will be on high dose PPIs, and, and then I will, I will plan to do an, an endoscopy. But the routine would be probably between somewhere six months to a year to do the, the first endoscopy, and then yearly for the first three years. Marcos, Hi. what do you think about what Axel and, and Luciano said about how often do you perform endoscopies in your patients? I, I only uh, perform endoscopy when they are symptomatic in the first year. And after the second year, I usually uh, uh, order an endoscopy once or once a year or in a year uh, uh, or every two years. I don't have any specific uh, protocol to, to perform endoscopy in a regular basis, but usually after two years and or if the patient have symptoms. Caetano, brother, what do you think about this? Well, uh, endoscopy, so. Yeah, so. As you all know, I am an endoscopist. And yes, I do Apollo too. I never had to close an ulcer with Apollo. I think these new therapies are just to take off of our hands the big rates of complications we are having reoperation. So I think anything you do for the patient that reduces complication is very nice and it's worth to, to, to try. Another thing I do think about endoscopies, I've been doing bariatric surgery for now for 25 years. So since we started back then, we have a protocol, a very strict protocol. We do endoscopies for six months and at a year and yearly 
for the patients that do the follow-up after four or five years because we do know we lose like more than 50 percent of these patients after five years so this is another reality so we do, don't really have the big numbers for the big data for more than three or five years of incidence of ulcers we only have the patients that come back with pain so we have a bias there of the numbers after three or four years of surgery but i can tell you some interesting things about what we've been doing for the last 25 years the first thing is that uh, we use ppis for three months and i do believe there are two different reasons for the ulcers the ulcer on the marginal ulcers i believe truly it is a ischemic ulcer and it's different from the dejunal ulcer where you have an ulcer for acid production and we do know there is enough acid production because we have a moderate uh, number of patients that do have esophagitis and even barrett's esophagus so i think these are two different ulcers but the treatment is the same and even if we are doing PPIs for only three months, our incidence of ulcers on six months and one year is very, very low. So this is why we do use it only for three months. And I saw there in the poll that there is a lot of uh, guys that do it for a year and the recommendations for a year. But I think now uh, about all the numbers, maybe I should publish this <laughs> and input our uh, big data experience on this because we do it when 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 you when we have until a year you have almost a hundred percent of patients doing endoscopies so this would be a very nice data to input to a discussion like this how symptomatic when how symptomatic do you see these patients Cayetano, when they consult you with a marginal ulcer how symptomatic well, this is very interesting. We do know that patients that have has perforations or bleeding, usually these patients do not have any symptoms of uh, at all. The first symptom is the perforation or the, the bleeding. So this is always a surprise for us and we, it gets us on our short pants because it's very hard to deal with these patients. Like Antonio showed us this case of a patient that was just in the postoperative period she didn't probably have any complaint before of any symptomatic complaint and suddenly she had this perforation on an opportunity time and uh i, I believe for, for all the guys here we have the same experience that for the first symptom is a perforation or bleeding so the patient that who usually they have symptoms and after we stop the ppi it's very common for these patients we use it uh, for a year and in some cases, and I do have some cases of patients with chronic ulcers, because when we started 25 years ago, we did an open surgery and the pouches was, were much bigger than we are doing today laparoscopically. So on these patients, we use chronically uh, use of PPIs and they really go well. So just a, a very, very small portion of patients, we had to reoperate and do a resection of this stomach. I knew that this topic was going to be a great topic. I know we are in the in the coronavirus quarantine and everything, and some uh, surgeons ask me why you are talking about marginal ulcers. We need to distract, gentlemen. We need to distract. We are surgeons. We are bariatric surgeons, and this topic is great. So we are going with the fourth question of the poll. Please, can you show it for us? What would you consider is the best option for a patient with multiple recurrence of marginal ulcers? What a question. Hmm? PPIs lifetime, truncal bagotomy, gastrogenal revision, reversed or ruin white gas bypass, a combination of B with another. Please vote now. This is a very interesting question, not an easy one, but it is very interesting to talk about this.
Okay, I think that we have the votation. Please, can we show it? Hmm. Juan Antonio, I want you to make a comment about that because you said that you prefer the reverse gut room why gut bypass. When you talk, okay, okay, no question about that PPI would be mandatory. A PPI would be mandatory, no question about that. To choose one of the surgery will be difficult because if we can take the answers. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. To okay. use PPI, no question about that. This is important. Always would be mandatory to use PPI for a long time. No question about it. What kind of surgery are you going to choose is one of the problems. You are talking about the patient has had no one ulcer, no two times, sometimes three times. You need to decide what are you going to do because in my first surgery, I do I, I do again the gastric jejun anastomosis with the healthy tissue. But if the patient one year after again with the ulcer, you need to think about another procedure. Reversion of the gastric bypass in some cases can be good option, but it's a major surgery. It has important complications. And one of the problems is regain weight. This is the point because in this kind of cases, to do endoscopic approach, I think is not the best, number one. Because the only thing that you do is to close to close the hood, sir. I don't have experience in to perform, to do again the gastro jejun anastomosis with the healthy tissue and to do truncal bagotomy can be a good option, only few reports in the world. And the other option, is to do reversion of the gastric bypass. I have done uh, one case in this kind of problem, reversal of the gastric bypass can be easy or can be very, very difficult. But the point, the incident or the average of complication, in the words for me, is regain weight. This is one of the problems. I don't know when the patient has three ulcer, you operate one, two times, what are we going to do? The most effective, I think, no question, is reversal. But I don't know if it's the best for the patient. Luciano, what do you think about that? I think this is probably the, the most important part from my perspective to discuss about marginal ulcer. So let's put things clear. Uh, the problem with marginal ulcer is that it's a lifelong risk. Just as the patient that uh, Dr. Lopez presented, this was a patient that was 10 years out. So you really don't know when this patient is gonna present. And that's actually, I would say, probably the, the best scenario when the, the presentation is really acute because the, the answer is go to do surgery and usually fix the hole and patch it and patients go well. Chronic ulcer is a different, different type of disease because there are just way so many factors involved from smoking, from NSAIDs, or patients that will not be compliant with whatever indication we will give them. At least from my experience, I got to reverse five uh, bypasses due to marginal ulcer a couple of years ago. And uh, the profile of the patient was always the same. And, and one of the risk factors that we, ha we haven't discussed, but we can see in the, at least in the American population, is the socioeconomic level or status, which means all these patients are paid or all these patients are covered by the government insurance and they will usually not have the education or understanding of, of what they are going they're supposed to do with their bypass and most of them actually had were like eight years out 10 years out they will have weight regain and they will have other issues such as for example alcoholism they never smoke but they started smoking 10 years after surgery they never did drugs, but they started doing drugs. And, and again, the bariatric patient is a patient that has so many different problems, especially psychiatric problems too. So going back to the question, if the patient, my strategy is if the patient comes first time with a marginal ulcer, of course, PPI, if the ulcer re recurs, lifetime PPIs, if the ulcer recurs again, then I will discuss with the patient the necessity of a gastrojejunal revision. 
and if it, it recurs again, I actually, in one year, I had a patient that I revised the gastro jejunal anastomosis twice. And the third time, the answer was, we're not gonna revise your anastomosis, we're gonna reverse your bypass. And if I had to, to, to say one, I guess, uh, surgical tip that I think is extremely important to reduce leaks after a RUNY gastric uh, bypass reversal, is these patients usually, even if they come with weight regain, they're gonna be malnourished. And what you need to do is to do a gastrotomy to relieve that anastomosis. And some patients actually, we did a <coughs> gastrotomy and actually due to the malnutrition, we had to put a jejunal uh, tube as well. So basically the gastrostomy was for venting and the jejunal was for feeding. So that patient was able to get nutrition one day after surgery and have the anastomosis, you know, vented in without tension. So these are very challenging questions. And again, the point to take home is, is you never know when this is gonna happen to one of the patients. And there are ways, just way too many patients with gastric bypass somewhere, just waiting for problems to occur. Thank you, Luciano. Axel, what do you think about that? About this last yeah. question? I agree. Absolutely, with with Luciano, I believe that it's very important what he have told to us. And it's important to differentiate the two situations. One is the multiple multiple recurrence of an ulcer, which for me, I believe that we have to take out all of the risk factors and um, maintain lifelong PPIs, of course. And the other situation, if the intractable ulcer, which does it means that is the ulcer with PPI, we, we look at all risk factors and we actually don't know what to do with these patients. For me, this is a patient for a gastrojejunal anastomosis revision. It's the first choice for me. Going to reversion of a gastric bypass, it's very complex. It's a very complex decision. I don't like very much the functional results of this type of surgery. I'm not afraid about the complications, but yes, about the functional, the intestinal functional problems that came after this kind of surgery. And of course, weight regain as Juan Antonio told to us. So for me, the first selection in an intractable user is to re revise the, the anastomosis, to resect it and to do it again. Okay, Estuardo, I would will, I will like to say something. I agree with Axel. Your fear option after the first time that the patient say, I have pain, I have pain, I cannot do anything. You need to, the fear option, I agree, I do that to do again the gastrojejunal anastomosis with a healthy healthy tissue. But the patient continue with the problem. You operate once and the patient continue with the problem. You need to choose another procedure because you will fail again. This is the point. And sometimes to say the risk factor is the most important. Yes, I agree, but it's difficult. The patient is small. 20, 30 cigarettes a day. The patient takes anti-inflammatory every day because the patient has a lot of disease. It's, it's a problem. If you see the patient complete, it's not easy to decide what are we going to do with good results. Because to cancel the medication, to cancel the drugs, to cancel uh, the ton of smoke, it's difficult. It's difficult everything. After two or three fails, you need to decide a major procedure. In these cases, I agree that the option is reversal of the gas bypass. But first option, I agree with you as well that you need to revise and to do again the gastrogenic. Axel? And um, what about a total gastrectomy? I don't because know. I don't have experience. <laughs> I don't know. Marcos, what do you think about this discussion? It's a nice discussion. Yeah, it's a nice discussion. Uh, I believe, I, I cannot imagine the patient that will prefer to reverse a surgery instead of stop smoking, quit smoking or quit uh, non-steroid drugs. Uh, I have never had any kind of, any case of that. Uh, and I never had to, to reverse a gastric bypass because of that as well. 
uh, I believe that he, my first option will be to put on PPI for long. Uh, if it doesn't work, I would rather do uh, a redo uh, gastro, uh, gastrojejun ostomy as Excel mentioned. But, well, uh, I will not reverse. Uh, I will let the, 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 the solution in the hands of the patient. He or she must stop uh, use drugs. He or she must quit smoking. If they don't do that, they will not relieve their symptoms, and it's it's their their option. I, I believe that I will not expose uh, for another procedure if there is a a non-surgical approach. In, in this case, uh, I will send to to the the psychiatrist, to the psychologist, uh, but I I will never, uh, not never, but I will I guess I will want. Uh, operate again because of that. Okay, Caetano? These are very complicated matters and the the thing is if you see everybody talking here, Estuardo, uh, everybody has very small numbers about what we are talking. So uh, there is, I believe there is not a solution and this is all about, you know, any publication about revisional surgeries. The numbers are so small and we cannot get a pattern and maybe uh, the best thing to do is keep a rationale that will bring less harm to the patient and the, the, the most acceptable results. I don't think, I, I wouldn't use the best results but the more acceptable because anything we do from uh, revisional surgeries, we will bring some harm to the patient and get into some risks maybe we did not need so this is i think it's a surgeon to patient call and we should make maybe here put some option that each of them each one of us do would do in this situation but not uh i don't believe it will be a thing to say do this or do that i think you see everyone here has a different opinion and i think everyone has some nice results and has their own uh, reasons to do what they did, the rationale. So this is, I think, is the most interesting thing about this. Yes, Luciana. Yes, Luciana. Let me let me make a comment. Can you hear me well? Yes. We yes. yes. So um, I think once you go down the pattern of revising the gastrojejunal anastomosis and revising it again, and even doing a ruined uh, gastro bypass reversal, I mean. Once you revise that anastomosis once and it didn't work, you are down into God knows what's going to happen. Why? Because even if you reverse your bypass, a lot of these patients, maybe you're going you're gonna to help the marginal ulcer, but these patients then will come back with another type of GI problem. And that stomach that was not working for so many years or, or God knows how long, will probably not empty. So, and that's another huge problem. It's like, what do you do with this patient that you already reversed the bypass and the stomach doesn't empty? Even if you preserve the vagal trunk or did whatever you needed to do, or even if you did a vagal, uh, a vagal uh, section in, and then you do a reversal, that stomach will not empty. And then and that's when total gastrectomy comes into a role uh, in doing esophagus jejunal anastomosis. But I think that the message is, as, as Dr. Marquesini was saying, once the, you have this problem and it comes back, this patient will probably always have some type of GI disturbances, and, and that's the, the the main thing. And probably but, it's, yeah, more, just, than, it's more than just functional. Okay? I just like to compliment what you're saying, Lucian. Is this uh, we cannot say the stomach will not function because the numbers of reversals are very small in the literature. Uh, I have only you see I have more than almost eight thousand cases then, and only did one reversal. And this patient went really well. I did reverse or not for ulcers, for other problems. I do have one only case too, that I did uh, an astomotic revision and the patient had another ulcer in a very, very small pouch. And you know, this patient, I because she wanted to do revision because she didn't, uh, she had symptoms, pain, but she didn't want to use PPIs high doses. I was using like 80 milligrams for her daily. To just to control the, the ulcer and after the ulcer recurred i told her well we're going to keep on the drugs 
because another revision maybe will be a full gastrectomy and will be a surgery with high incidence of complications. This was my position. But probably she, if she went to another surgeon, he would say, well, you have to do a total gastrectomy because you cannot use PPIs in high doses. So this is what I'm talking about. The numbers are so small that anything you say about this is about your only experience with very few cases. So we, this is a very nice discussion, Estuardo. Very nice, the, 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 the issue is very, very nice to talk about. Yeah. Well, Estuardo, I want to say okay. some comments. Uh, again, we are talking about the worst scenario. Fortunately, our few cases with this scenario, fortunately, but when we talk about reversion, the patient starts to regain weight, and the patient starts with the comorbidity, and the patient starts to, to take another drug. It's difficult to decide what are we going to do in these kind of cases. Some doctor told me, send another surgeon, it's a solution. No, but the, <laughs> It, it, this is the worst scenario. The worst scenario, most of the time, we once new gastrointestinal ophthalmosis can be enough, can be enough. But if we talk about two or three times, we need to do a major surgery. Okay, please, can we see the first question of the poll? Fifth question, okay. What do you think about tobacco as a risk factor for marginal ulcers? Please select only one. What do you think about tobacco as a risk factor for marginal ulcers? PPI's prophylaxis should be extended. It is essential to reduce tobacco consumption. Tobacco should be discontinued. A plus B, A plus C. Please vote now. You're going to have 30 seconds to do that, please. Please show us the results. Okay. I see. Okay. Thank you. Go back. The screens. This is perfect. Luciano. Yeah, I, I think that um, that I, I will, I think probably I would like to rephrase the question because this is, um, this is one of those topics and, and type of patient that one encounter. So if the patient can't stop smoking, will you still offer a surgery? My answer is, is no. I mean, the patient needs to stop smoking to have a gastric bypass. There's no way I'm going to do a gastric bypass on a patient that is a smoker. Um, and again, usually what we like to say is we we shouldn't be more concerned about the patient's health than the patient self or herself, right? So I think PPI is for sure the, the, the way to go if the patient uh, stops smoking or re-smokes and then goes on and off for a period of time. But the, the main thing is to treat, I mean, those patients that are smoking. Sometimes I think that a lot of these problems are just, again, Obesity is 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 a gut brain problem. So a lot of the problems are really in the brain. So you need to really have the patient really prepared to understand what they're gonna undergo and what they need to do. Right? Our part is the easy part. We love to operate. The surgeries are beautiful. <laughs> okay. Axel, this is your question. Uh, I I don't agree completely with Luciano. I actually. Uh, perform some cases in patients that didn't stop smoking before surgery. They slow down smoking, but they didn't stop it. Uh, and I accept to operate them. Uh, fortunately, they didn't, they didn't have any complication at the time, but I don't know in the future. Uh, I think it's very important minimum to slow down it and the recommendation is always to stop it before surgery and even in the case that they stop it the ASMBS have a, in the guidelines one recommendation about stopping smoking six weeks before 
the evidence about that is questionable, but this is the recording, the recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we do the same. We recommend it, and in the case of a patient that stops smoking, you never have the the, the guarantee that it will never again uh, or start. Well, no, uh, you will start in the future. You don't know. Perhaps or probably yes. So I don't know if it's an absolute contraindication. I believe it, it is not. Marcos. What? what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I believe I, I, I completely agree with Axel. I usually recommend that they quit smoking for at least one month before surgery. But we know that some of them, they don't and they only are able to reduce the amount of cigarette smoking in the daily basis. And I make myself clear for the patient, uh, showing that this is a, their responsibility and this uh, could increase the risk for not only for uh, marginal ulcers, but for respiratory problems for thromboembolic issues. And well, after everything is very clear, I, I can operate even if they didn't quit smoking at all. Caetano. I think that there was a question that we should make after uh, Luciano said, we shouldn't do gastric bypass in mm -hmm. patients that or uh, smokers. The question is, are 100% of patient smokers have marginal ulcers? And the answer is no, because we do a lot of operations on a right. lot of patients that restart smoking after that and they are, have no problem. So I think it's a little bit radical in saying that. And if you go to Europe, there's a large number of people that still smokes here in, in, in other countries, we know that the, they diminished a lot for camp, big campaigns, but in Europe, you go to France, they, there are a lot of big smokers there. So I think this is a little bit too radical. I think as surgeons, as physicians, we should tell our patients uh, to stop smoking at any condition, operating or not, for gastritis or, or whatever. But, and we should tell them that they are in risk factor for marginal ulcers and complications of it if they continue to smoke. This is a fact. But, uh, and I still do believe, Luciano, that it is a gut brain problem. But I can show you in very, very new studies that our gut is changing the brain and not on the other side. So, what we are doing is just more, much more important than just cutting and suing. What we are doing is changing a lot of architectural uh, factors that makes the brain change because the change we do at, at the gut. So I really do, I have two psychiatrists that work with my patients in the pre-op. I have this, it's very nice to have psychiatrists and I have psychologists too, but I have two psychiatrists. It's very nice for me to study that and know about it. So I think we should not be so radical and not, you know, think that we are the 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 the, the key holders of the future of the patients <laughs> we are not so i think what we should do is think like global and bigger the big picture about what we are doing and we are doing very good for these patients even for the smokers gastric bypass has shown to be a very nice surgery i've been doing duodenal switches i've been doing a lot of different surgeries and at the end point, I always got to get back to the gastric bypass. So we shouldn't bury it because of marginal ulcers. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I guess I, I've been called, um, I guess, radical. I, I don't think I'm a radical, but, but I, I, I get the point, And I think that's the, that's the reason of this discussion. Um, I think that, uh, that the message in general, the message is you should not do a surgery on a patient that is smoking in general. Um, um, a gastric bypass, and I think that's that's the message that I, I wanted to send. I mean, there are for sure exceptions, and we we don't know if the patient will restart smoking in the future, or if, or even the patient never smoked and started smoking. 
uh, it's a very different complex and I, I agree completely with uh, what you just said about uh, basically the gut curing the, the brain and we see a lot of that not, not only with, with the smoking but with anxiety, right? The patient that is so anxious and, and after surgery anxiety is gone. Uh, I think it's a very complex problem in, in I guess just I, I like to sound a little bit less radical so I would say usually if a patient is a smoker I will find another procedure that will suit the patient better maybe okay i want to say something very very fast remember we are talking about the margin ultra but we are talking about the obese patient the obese patient needs to stop smoke needs to change the, the diet need to do exercise need to change the behavior need to do a lot of things stop smoking at once but we need to do a lot of things for the patient in this case ppi and the psychiatric in the multidisciplinary group. But remember, the patient needs to change a lot of things, needs to change the life, not only the stop the smoke. For five minutes for questions. Caetano, how many questions do we have from the audience? Well, we have a lot of questions. Very okay. big. It was very, very hard to, 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 to choose because I'm supposed to choose like the, the, thing, the questions I, I do think it's uh, uh, are more important, but there, there's a very interesting question here. <clears throat> Would you, in a patient with uh, uh, with a surgery that you you decided to revise, would you reset the remnant stomach? You to what? Say again. I didn't reset hear. the remnant stomach. Would ah. you take down the remnant stomach? <laughs> That's a very nice question. Very Come nice on, question. Axel? Not in every case, but of course in, a, in the case of uh, gastrogastric fistula, but not in every I agree with Axel. Only if what? I have a gastrogastric fistula. Instead, I will never remove the, the, the remnants. What do you think and I another, another comment, please. And if you perform the trunk of Bagotomy too. That's the other situation. Yeah. What do you Who think I done about that question? Trunk of Bagotomy here. Who has done uh, trunk of Bagotomy? Who has experience in that? In bariatric? Not in bariatric. Oh, I'm talking about bariatric. In, in this case, in this case. Yeah. No, only I, I, I check the data. Only few reports, kinds of reports, are in Trincopagotomy. Luciano. Yeah, no, I, I agree with uh, what said um, before. In truncal, I, I never performed a truncal vagotomy, but we actually had a patient that had a truncal vagotomy and a GJ revision at another institution, and then we had to take care of the marginal ulcer that recurred. And that was one of, I think, the nightmares that I had uh, um, because this patient got the reversal of the gastric bypass and I think that was a, a, a mistake because he didn't work at all and the patient ended up having this terrible gastroparesis and the patient would be like vomiting like six months after surgery, like every single day, will come into the ER with nausea, will have an NG tube get some of the stomach drain and this patient ended up in a total gastrectomy and esophago jejunostomy. So that was a really challenging, really, really challenging uh, problem. So there are some things I think that we don't know in, in truncal vagotomy and gastrojejunal revision sounds like a really great option. But well, this patient, of course, had hypertension, um, obesity came back and uh, she also had, she also was diabetic as well. So probably was oh. not the right thing to do with her. I still remember her time to time. So uh, another another question is about using PPIs in high dosage. Do you think if you use chronically, you will have problems in some vitamins or micronutrients absorption? What do you think about this? This is another question. Or who? Yeah. For the for all the for all you guys. <laughs> I I need comments. This oh, I never think from, about that. From from folks looking I, at I you. wouldn't I I in my case I wouldn't change the supplements. I even with the high doses, 
I keep the same usually. Yeah, I think I think that the best the best thing to do is check uh, vitamin levels, and and I think nowadays um, a lot of patients already know this uh, long term risk of uh, taking PPIs, and patients will ask you, "It's like, doctor, I'm going to have a risk of having like uh, CD. I'm going to have risk of having like a calcium deficiency. I'm going to have risk of having overgrowth bacteria." Um, osteoporosis, uh, Alzheimer, renal disease, cardiac problems. I mean, there are so many new things that haven't been shown in really good level or quality evidence, quality, quality level evidence. But I think in terms of vitamins, you need to check on, on the vitamins. And I will be concerned of maybe having more problems with vitamin uh, or calcium absorption. Another question uh, is that uh, we talk about perforation, about bleeding, but in case of severe stricture, would you change your your plan instead of trying to treat it? Uh, if you dilate and this dilation was very hard to do and you go for endoscopy and it's still difficult, would you go directly for surgery or would you try again another treatment and dilate it? One. Endoscopic question. <laughs> well, it's difficult to decide according with the response of the PPI, but if the patient has obstruction, you take a lot of problems with the dilation, go to the surgery. Axel, what do you think? Well, I think that it's it's a very difficult situation because you are in the middle of uh, of, of the problem. If you delay it too much, you can perforate it. And if you don't delay it, it, there's no solution possible. So I think you have to delay the structure, uh, perhaps uh, very carefully, of course, and <coughs> with many sessions. But it's a very important factor to be to be solution if we want to. Uh, resolve the, the problem of the the ulcer. Marcos, I, I don't think to. Well, I, I was thinking that I am very direct. fortunate because uh, those problems we are mentioning, uh, I don't see them in my my clinic. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, I only do uh, hensium anastomosis and I remove the staple line, so I don't have any kind of foreign material nor I have any uh, uh, bridge or ischemic bridge in the anastomosis. So I believe that uh, I have few ulcers and I don't have any case with a very large ulcer and a stenosis at the same time. Well, I believe that I will dilate if I had a case like that, keep on PPI for long, high doses, and try to keep it clinically uh, and avoid a uh, reop. But even so, I, I have any case of that and it, it is not uh, going well with conservative treatment. I offer, or I may offer uh, a revision and uh, redo anastomosis. Estuardo, just one last question for uh, Juan and Luciano. If you do the reversal, would you sleeve the stomach at the uh, reversal at the same time? Very difficult. The pouch. Is leave the pouch, you mean? No, no. But when you do the reverse. If you have the complete reverse, stomach reverse to sleep. and regain weight, I think you need to evaluate the, the complete patient because maybe most of the time it's not the moment to do the sleeve gastrectomy. But if the patient regain, the possibilities are very high. You need to think about that because the patient regain, uh, uh, regain, uh, uh, restart with the comorbidity, new drugs, is a catastrophe. And I know that I there are some reports about that. In the same times, reversal and sleep gastrectomy. I don't have experience. Can be an option. Luciano. Yeah. I 
I, I, um, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, the thing is you need to treat the problem of the patient. And, and usually if you are doing a surgery for marginal ulcer, that's your problem. And uh, weight regain is for sure gonna be a problem um, long-term. And that's probably when you could consider maybe doing, yeah, as Dr. Lopez said, um, there are some, some reports of doing even reversal of gastric bypass and then doing a duodenal switch at the same time, which I, again, I, I don't think that sounds, that sounds way too risky for me. These patients have really poor, you know, poor healing. They, you're going to reverse a bypass. Usually they have malnutrition on top of that and, and other medical problems. I, I, I would think it probably wouldn't be the best option for the patient. And remember, Luciano, some of them, they have malnutrition. Be careful with that. Absolutely. It's true. There's a lot of questions, a very big amount of them. I think I got, you know, some of them that were very interesting. Thank you for the invitation. And now it's your words, my friend. Okay. So thank you very much, gentlemen. You can see, podemos hablar en español y estamos hablando en inglés. O en portoñol. But this is nice. Uh, I want to thank to, to IPSO for the opportunity to do this webinar for us, the first IPSO LAC webinar. So this is going to be the first of several. And I want to thank to each one of you. Pedro Martinez, you are there, you are listening. Thank you very much for all your, your job or your work. Manuela, you are mute too. Muchas gracias, Manuela. Molto gracias. Thank you to you, gentlemen, Marcos, Axel, Luciano. Juan Antonio. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I enjoyed to see you, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank so, you very much, guys. It was a great honor to stay with you. Audience. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day for you. Great, great discussion. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Manuela. This session has been recorded, so you will can see uh, later, but because we already have uh, 208 people watching us, so they can see it later or tomorrow uh, in the Virtual Academy of IFSO. So thank you very much, and God bless you all. Stay, Stay care, everyone. Take Stay care, care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.